people self-sabotaging. They'll start telling you that they don't like what, what you're doing. Uh, friends will no longer be supportive. Family issues will arise with like you change your eating habits. Hello, YouTube, and welcome to the first ever Art of Charm Happy Hour. Now, as you guys might know, we've been doing our podcast for about 14 years now. And with the frequency that it comes out and everything that we like to do, sometimes the conversations and guests that we'd like to have on that show are a little bit outside of its scope. So here we are opening up a new show for you guys to explore these ideas here on YouTube. And I'd like to welcome our first guest of the show. Good to be here, my brother. Alexander Cortez. Alexander, why don't you say hello to everybody here? What's up, everybody? I've been a personal trainer for 10 years. I've been working in the self-development space for about four, yeah, four years, going on five years. And the big focus of my business is getting men upgraded physically, but also upgrading the mindset and presentation as well, with the basis being, obviously, your body, your physique, since that's, as I say, the, the physique, if you can change your body, that's proof you can change the rest of your life. Well, a very direct effect to that, so. And not only are you able to change your life, uh, it's gonna change your perspective of how you see things, it's gonna change your relationships, and I don't know why, but it seems to have gotten, well, at least in, in our crowd, even self-development in itself, uh, has gotten a bad name for it. Gets stigmatized at times. It, it does. It's, it's a strange thing where, uh, and this is like sort of like a generational sentiment, I feel like, where we want to, we're, we're, we're culturally raised where you want to believe everybody can you know, be successful and you know, aspire to have wealth, riches, material abundance, you know, Instagram lifestyle. Like we, want, we want to look good, we want to be good, we want to do good. But then when it comes down to like personal struggles, whether that be with your body, your self-confidence, or your charm, or how you interact with people, or your, your sense of being a man, the fact that someone has to consciously work on that, that carries a heavy stigma of, of you know, what is it? Like, you shouldn't have to work on that, that should come naturally? Or you know, is that something like, or it's shameful to, you know, to need help in that area? It's almost like when people like go to therapy, it's like, mm -hmm. maybe you need therapeutic help. Oh, I, I could never admit to needing that. I'm like, but you know that you need it. You know, why are we making people feel bad about wanting to improve themselves? Well, I, I think it also comes down to this idea that everyone, this, this inclusion idea where everyone needs to be accepted. And that's fine. I think that everyone should be accepted. However, you walk into the room and you realize that there are people doing things that you'd like to be doing. So perhaps it's on you to put yourself in a position to be able to do those things rather than people handing you those things just because you showed up. Well, that, that's the, I would definitely the entitlement culture. I, I grew up in the 1990s and I, mm -hmm. I saw that with my, my generation. Like you, it's not even millennials per se, it's just the whole, whole state of culture right now where there's this element of both like entitlement and narcissism where like you're, you're perfect just the way you are, but you're so perfect you don't need to change or work on anything, but also you deserve a, B, C, D, alpha, gamma, beta, gamma, beta, delta. You deserve all these things as well, just for existing. So I'm like, oh, where in that is your you know, own ownership for yourself and your actions and consequences? And you know, maybe you do need to work on things like that. Somehow, somehow that, gets, that gets vastly overlooked, you know, or just dis, dis, or gets discarded. And then people will get mad at you for making them feel bad about themselves you know, in a way that you never even intended. You know, telling someone that it would be great if you got fit and you know, felt good about yourself. Well, does that mean I should feel bad at myself now? No, but that's a very interesting mimetic reversal. <coughs> that's how it makes you so I, one of my big things with, with fitness philosophy, um, I never intend to be a personal trainer. Like, so my goal actually is to be a ballet dancer. That's what I want to do. Mm -hmm. Which always surprises people. They're like, you don't look like you'd want. I think I saw you post something about that uh, yeah. on Twitter. But, uh, but that, was, that was my goal when I was in high school. Like, I, I got into dancing late, around like 15, 16. And I really loved it, and I, I decided, you know, this is what I want to do as a career professionally. I want to be a ballet dancer, I want to perform, and my aspirations were not to be famous or be known or be a leader of men. It was just, I want to do the, the thing that I'm passionate about. And that didn't work out, just for the reasons I got a bunch of injuries in college, to the point where I couldn't dance anymore. Um, you know, foot, ankle, hip, all, a whole bunch of things got hurt. So I started personal training. Uh, as a way to just try to make money. It was like a very, like a fallback thing. I'm like, well, I have a degree that's not worth anything. Dance performance choreography degree. Sure. That's not a real degree, it's not. But uh, I was like, what can I do that will pay more than minimum wage? So it's like personal training. So I started doing that and but what no one tells you is that personal training is not an exercise job, it's a talk job. Mm -hmm. It's basically exercise as therapy. So you really have to have a really keen understanding of human behavior and everyone's gonna come to you, come to you with their problems. 
Because like, why wouldn't they? Like you're spending an hour in a person's face talking to them Absolutely. multiple times a week. You're gonna have to get to know them. Well, and there's, let's face it, there are reasons why they are going to the gym. And that's usually for everybody, it's to get some perspective on the, the rest of their day with the things that they're, the challenges they have coming up. Very true. So that, but like I was 20 when I started and I realized it right away that the physical part's easy. Like that can, you can write out sets and reps and exercises. It's the mental game that everyone needs work on. So I, I realized, okay, like training is a self-improvement job essentially. Like it is, it is. Yeah, whether you know, trainers will say that or not, it is. But that got me sort of studying human behavior. And you, know, like you kind of go through like the, the realms of like different kinds of psychological theory, like Adler, Adler, Freud, Jung, cognitive behavioral therapy, and everything kind of has its, you know, its useful bits and approaches where mm -hmm. you're just trying to have a good conversation with somebody and hopefully offer them some constructive. Probably the biggest thing I, learned was what's called the mimetic instinct by, it's Rene Girard, it's like a French yeah. Sort of, yeah, new age philosopher, but the big thing with the mimetic instinct, and the reason why I bring it up because it underlies everything, is that human beings, instinctively, inherently, biologically, we always want to mimic and copy and replicate mm -hmm. any kind of interaction, you know, behavior, dialogue we have with somebody. And we can do that two ways. We can copy it and want to be like the thing, or we can react adversely to it and want to make the thing go away. So, I mean, if I, if we, we're, we're friendly right now, obviously talking. If I suddenly get angry, that's gonna be a very strange thing of like, why would you switch the interaction all of a sudden? You know, but at the same time, if I'm being friendly to you, but you don't like me, you want me to know that you don't like me. So you have to reverse it back. But you see this play out with people's reactions to going back to the self-improvement thing where some people identify with it positively. They want to, yes, I want to evolve. But then you also have the negative reaction. No, I don't want that. And that makes me feel bad at myself. And not only do I not want that, but you should not be allowed to express that. And you'll get these really weird antagonistic reaction, especially online, in the digital world, where people will flap to handle about things that you would never presume to even be upsetting. Well, one of the things that I, and when it comes to working out, and, and I, I'm an advocate, I'm at the gym every morning, I, and I try to do a lot of running as well, uh, it helps me clear my mind. And there, to me, and maybe you can uh, elaborate on this a bit, being a, a trainer and working in it for so long, I see two realms of physical fitness. Number one is the, well, I just don't want to get fat. Yeah. There's that guy, right, or a person. And number two is, I'm going in to gain. Mm. So that's a comp so there's the begrudging person who goes in because they just don't want to be overweight and they're just trying to maintain. And then there's the person who is going in for mind, body, and spirit to gain uh, wisdom and control over their body. And I personally know the exact moment where that shift was for me. And it was, a, it was the very first David Goggins interview that I saw on Rogan, mm. where I watched that and I was like, oh, I'm going into the gym the completely wrong way. You know, I, there was a sense of, of always accomplishment and going in, but now there is a, there's almost this divine reason of like something larger than me of why I'm going in there. There's now a purpose. And, and what I'm gaining from this is is a lot more than than I can get anywhere else, and so uh, it it makes getting up in the morning so much easier, knowing what I'm receiving from going in there, mm -hmm. rather than the oh, I can't believe I got to do this. I'm gonna I guess I'll make some coffee. I, I hope it's not so bad today. Now it's let's do this. Let's fire this up. Yeah, that, that, that's a that's a good that speaks to the fact that. What I've seen from this, some of these clients is pain is, pain is always the catalyzer of transformation mm -hmm. for most people. Like very, it, it takes a certain level of self-awareness to want to improve just for the sake of like your own aspiration. So most people, it's, most people their reason for training, for physical health, it starts with like a pain motivation. It's fear-based. Fear -based. I don't want to get fat, which is entirely reasonable. That's a good way to get started to get in there. There's nothing so much, there's nothing really aspirational about that. It's, I, I'm afraid of this happening, so I'll try to stop it. Mm -hmm. you know, versus, you know, I'm aspire to something, so I'll build towards it. And you know, sometimes the ways I phrase it is like you have sort of a, you have ascendant inspiration, and then you have like descending motivations. Mm -hmm. And the descending ones are just all the fear-based ones. I don't want to be this, I don't want to be that. You know, women especially, I don't like this about my body, I don't like this, but I don't like that about my body. Yeah, even men can have kind of that reaction, like they, they don't like themselves, and like certainly you get a lot of emotional energy from that, but that burns itself out very quickly because like, okay, well what does that turn into? If you never get into that vision of like, what am I trying to become? 
you can, you can circle this drain of sort of self-loathing, resentment, some action that's consistent but you're never really happy about, that can go on forever. And then when you meet some people where they challenge themselves for the sake of, well, what will this turn me into? It's like, that, that's a big mental shift, like, oh, wow. And that's something I always try to describe to clients. I'm like, yes, the first part of this journey will probably suck. Yeah. Because you might, things might not happen as quickly as you want. The weight coming off, like, that can only go, that can only happen so physiologically fast. You're going to struggle, you're, or it's going to create distance with other people in your life, and then you're going to get sort of this magic mirror effect happening where people self-sabotaging, they'll start telling you that they don't like what, what you're doing. Uh, friends will no longer be supportive. Family issues will arise with like you change your eating habits. But if you can move past that, you'll get to a stage where you could say it's like somewhat actualized. Like, all right, I'm actually I'm evolving now, and I'm better than I was before. And this is actually something that I can apply to other areas. And then the metaphor starts oh, to make more sense. Absolutely. I well, with our classes at the Art of Charm, there is a defeatist idea of people that come in. They're like, I can't believe I have to be here. I'm broken. I need these skills. Hmm. And much like w w the fear raising or the defensive position of going to gym. I'm getting overweight and I guess I gotta go to the gym now. But if you can, as you were mentioned, if you can move past that and realize what you're gaining, because I always tell people for, the, for those people who are bummed out that they're here or, or, or coming to the show because of a deficiency that they've recognized in themselves that they're upset about. It's like, okay, you can have that idea, but what you're about to gain is an inside uh, knowledge of inner workings of human behavior, uh, how rapport works, conversation flow, emotional bids, which makes you that much better. And so rather than thinking that you are here because of a deficiency, know that you are here because of what you're about to gain and who you're about to come through this journey. And it's like, that is such a shift for the guys who, as you were mentioning, who are looking at it from a fear-based thing, because if it wasn't for that fear pushing you in, you're never going to learn about all these things that are that are out there that make you a better person. No, no, you won't. I'm, I, I have seen guys get very far with with essentially like a self-destructive motivation. You see it sometimes in competitive sports, especially strength sports, where it's it's very much like sort of the, almost like the 97-pound weakling kind of story, uh, where the guy was weak, maybe he got made fun of, he decided to become strong. And he, he was bullied, and you can keep that fire going for a while, but then you all, the, this, in the process of doing that, it requires you to stay in that sort of like, you know, like we just talked about, that terrorized state of always being angry at yourself, always being angry at somebody else, mm -hmm. always needing opponents somehow, where you know, things happen to me you know, because of other people. Uh, and I've seen that like break guys' lives up, even while reaching a fairly high level of success, which is always interesting. Like people, you can get pretty far ahead still being you know, sort of emotionally, you know, whether you want to say underdeveloped and competent in a lot of areas, but you're always going to hit that threshold where, like, you can't go any farther. And the reason is you. It's not because of all these externalities. It's you. And are you willing to address that? You know, in some cases they are, and they have the mental shift, and obviously some people, the answer is no. Yeah, I don't, if, I don't, I don't know how long you can, can, can continue that if you don't have that, that shift. The other thing that you mentioned there is this idea of, of, of competition, and maybe this will, we can uh, transition into Twitter a little bit, which any, so uh, there is this, this concept at AOC, which is four behavioral patterns that you should, you should understand mm. about yourself and people around you. So you know who to bring into your life and you know who to keep at a distance, and it just gives you an inside baseball track of what's going on, yeah. especially upon reading the room. The first one is supplicative. These are people who beg for approval, acceptance, and attention, and they shrink in, in moments of challenge. Then there's the combative people who look to take attention, approval, and acceptance from others in any, any way they can, by putting others down, by inflating, putting other people in fear of them. The, the third is where I get in trouble on Twitter is the competitive people who see everything as a zero-sum game and they're mm. rolling into it and, they're, and now they must compete for attention, approval, and acceptance. And lastly, the fourth value is cooperative value, which is you're going to give value in order to get value. And as you know in, on Twitter, the more you put out there to other people, the more you get in return. Yes. And we can talk about that and certainly how we, we've... Be, come here to, to have this conversation. Yeah. But any time that I put out anything about the competitive 
uh, nature and people and, and where that goes awry. I have nothing wrong with healthy competition. Iron sharpens iron and makes you a better person. However, you cannot view relationships or business relationships as a zero sum competitive game. That will get you in trouble. And anytime that I post this out, I always, and, and I have to, I, I had to learn to not engage in this mm -hmm. because it's ridiculous, but I always have people lashing out at me of how competition makes you better, you need to be angry, you need to compete at all times. And I'm like, this is where you have stopped evolving in, in, in your development. And because of that, until you start realizing that this idea is going to continue creating the same problem for you over and over and over again, you're not going to evolve above that to the cooperative state. Um, and so, I, and of course, as I said, anytime I put these things out, I naturally get that, that flashback mm. or backlash. Yeah, I mean, competition, you know, from, like a, from a male perspective, like this like raw masculinity, like yeah, men need to compete. Like that brings out, like what does that bring out? It requires you to be strong, requires yep. you to be self-aware. It makes you aware of other people. Oh, that guy is better at me than this, that. Maybe I can beat him in this. You know, certainly, like, what is, what is a sport? What is a game? Like, you are playing a competition. But at the same time, like, that is a game. If you take that approach, you know, to everything in life, you know, what happens? You're going to put yourself at, at odds with people constantly all the time. Mm -hmm. um, like, so, like, what are you afraid of? Well, I don't want to lose. I can't lose. So, like, you have to, you have to <laughs> lose. So, I can win. Like, in certain contexts, that that can work like yeah I'm not, of course like some it's a you, there's a winner and loser okay uh, but in the context of relationships or in the context of let's say like building a business or trying yeah you know, like what we've done on Twitter like yeah the way my business works I'm like there's yes there I could say there's thousands and ten of thousands of, like fitness personalities they're, they're all, all over they're all over are we all competing for the same pool of people and like I, I have to win so someone else can lose I'm like if you take that if you apply that to too many areas you are one you're always going to be in fear but two, the, like threshold of competency, you're going to create problems for yourself because you're not going to be looking for areas of growth or cooperation or value creation. You're just going to be looking at things where you can beat a number or beat a metric or somebody, I can detract from what you're doing. And then, you, then you'll probably start playing the comparison game, which is crippling a lot of athletes. If you, you know, Of course. You can tell, I mean, I've trained a lot of pro athletes, and they, a lot of times they'll suffer through that where they start, their performance starts falling off. They just start freaking out. Of course. That guy's better than me, that guy's better than me, and I don't know what's wrong with me right now. And it just it becomes this death spiral of just like this, you know, this sort of like this low self-esteem sort of intuition, or not intuition, but like instinct kind of like takes over. And it can just ruin their performance, ruin their career. And you know, like that's that's a big thing that is in sports psychology, which is which is not like I'm not gonna profess to be a specialist in it, but just in the context of being a personal trainer, you oftentimes have to study sports psychology, but that's one of the big, thing, big things with like the best athletes. Like, yes, you want to be competitive, and your very nature should make people better by you being there. But you also have to recognize if you are playing, you know, not even a team sport, but playing anything where you are required to have the support of other people, you need to bring something to the table that makes those people want to invest in you and vice versa. Otherwise, it, it's going to become a self-destructive process, and a lot of people flame out that way. The, that's an old story. The flame out is something that needs to be brought up because that's... It, we see that happening a lot, especially with social media. You come up with some ideas, you get them out there, and then if any, if you get any traction, then you're you put this pressure on yourself to to continue to to create at the level that you came into it with, mm. which should help in inspiring you to really dig deep to to get some good stuff. But it it is difficult, and and, and I see it with the the young kids who do. Uh, YouTube videos or Instagram where they get in this in that treadmill where you will burn yourself out if you don't give yourself the break of of allow to, to, to go through the ebbs and flows of creativity. I've been I've been writing I guess you'd say prof I've been writing professionally for seven years and I think the the, the big divide between like a good creative artist versus a great one a, a person that's a good creative artist They'll produce good work, but they also will want to withhold anything they think is not good. Mm -hmm. So they'll be in that trap of like, I want to create and I'm trying to produce, but at the same time, like, I keep comparing this to what I did before. Maybe I had some success here, and like nothing I produced after that has had the same effect, or hasn't gone viral the same way, or hasn't gotten the same number of reads, or likes, or comments, or shares. You, you have all these metrics now that you can you can use them to your benefit, or they can just totally screw with you. So then they start like either withholding or they keep trying to copy the same formula and they just, it becomes this, like you said, this sort mm -hmm. of treadmill of like, you're not really progressing in worthy craft. Versus I think like with a great artist, 
they just share everything. You know, I've been writing for seven years. I've had a newsletter for three now. I've got a lot of subscribers. I write almost like every other other day. So mm -hmm. I mean, I can, I've, in the last few years, I've probably written like a million words. Like it's a lot of writing. Some of it's great. I've had people, I've written things. I didn't, I didn't even think were good. People will contact me. This was incredible. Thank you for producing this, making this. This is the best thing I've read. This really helped me. Like you changed my life. And I'm like, wow. I, and I, this is me. Like I realize you can't be judgmental about your work that way yeah. or about your actions. I'm like the creative process, the process of personal evolution, you might think you know, like definitely there's an up and down. You don't necessarily have a perspective on where the up and down is. Mm -mm. You can think you're at a low point and maybe you're actually progressing, but you don't like what you're doing. It's, it's like, it's this very weird, you know, situation to try to sort of gain uh, oversight on. But I've written things I thought were totally just generic. I'm like, I didn't even like this person <laughs> anyway. And they'll get an amazing response. I've written things I thought were brilliant and I don't get any feedback. Nothing. 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 Yeah, I mean, you probably have the same thing. Me, you do an episode, like, this is the best episode. Oh, yeah. You hear nothing. Oh, you're this like, is this is going to be a game yeah, changer oh, yeah. when this drops. Oh, man, I can't believe it. <laughs> nothing. You're I've right. got, I, the other, it was about a week ago, I got into a place where I was, um, for whatever reason, the, the, the Twitter gods were lying. I was getting all this engagement. Things were really fun. And then I had a day where like nothing was happening. And my, my, my first paranoid thought is, that's it, I'm being shadow banned. They uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> and, and then the next day, everything was back to normal. And I went, maybe just what I wrote yesterday sucked. They just went cool. <laughs> no, I, 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 I started tweeting like in 2015. And Twitter, like, you know, with any social media in general, we, like, again, it's always this paradoxical relationship. People say like you don't take it too seriously, but everybody takes it seriously. Of course. And yet we and everyone, like, we all somehow know like, wow, you can basically change the world, access the global brain, yeah. get inspiration, learn new things. You you could literally use it. It's a knowledge library and it's an entertainment feed. It's all these things at once. So it's like, no, don't take it too seriously, but be really serious about when you use it, but you can't, so it, you know, it's, it's never gonna quite align. It's not rational, obviously. But with Twitter, I realized when I started tweeting on tweeting back in like 2015, at that time, I was, I was working at a gym in Florida, and I just I had always been a very avid reader. I'd always been a, I'd been a writer, obviously. And like I used it as sort of like a way to get my thoughts out, fitness thoughts, client conversations, interactions. And so I've, always, I've always been that, I've just had that brain where I'm like, I'll have a conversation with somebody, you know, training someone, and then like I'll kind of mentally rehearse it and be like afterwards. I'm like, what could I take from that to be useful, a lesson, something? So I, I would use Twitter for that, and I started to grow a following. I'm like, oh, this, this is interesting. And this, in self improvement, Twitter was not a thing then. At all. Yeah, you know, much we'll like get to in a moment. Yeah, yeah, much like you know, like ecom YouTube. Like a few years ago, you're like ecom what? Yeah, now you can get on YouTube and there, there's gurus and people telling you learning how to drop ship. Oh, and oh yeah, Amazon it's huge. Just all these things that just didn't exist. But that didn't exist then. But I had that happen like the first time I had a, a tweet that got like a hundred retweets. And like all these people. I remember like, my first. Wow, time. this is so cool. And then you know, but the next day it doesn't happen. Or like when you have your first like one thousand retweet, and you're like, and you look at like, wow, tens of thousands of people read this. But you can't make that happen again and again and again. No. Yeah, you know, like insight. I mean, this is sort of like a greasy idea. Like a lot of the, I think the creative thoughts we have those. You know those formulations. I don't think they necessarily they come from us. We're sort of accessing them. Like there's always that artistic you know process where you, yes you can think and you can buy, try and be creative, but some things will just come to you and like it flashes brilliance or mm -hmm. it just arrives and it crystallizes. And did you really even think it? No, maybe not. It just somehow came out perfectly worded and it perfectly resonated. But you can't replicate that again. Here's the thing that that I find fascinating with it. That you it stri it makes you strip everything down so you can't overcomplicate things, and I certainly have a tendency to overcomplicate things. I think most people have a tendency to overcomplicate things, especially if you work in an analytical problem solving um, field, or that's just how your mind works. And I think I've learned more in the last few months that I've been very proactive on Twitter than I, I've learned in the last year, just because of its it's basic functions where, and, and I'll get up in the morning, realize, oh, I don't have anything coming out today or till later, I better throw something together. And I'll be groggy and I'll tweet out something, I'll go to the gym, I come back and it went haywire. <laughs> Comparatively to the hour I sat to come up with some philosophical mm -hmm. mind blower that I think is gonna change the world. Yeah, I, I mean, I've, ha I've had great tweets that went viral that were like even like short story things, like uh, I remember, Tweeting something, what was it? It was a 
this was like a few years ago, and I, I was, I mean, this was so off the cuff. I was like driving in my car, and I, I can't even tell you what, like, what gave me the inspiration. I was, I, they would tweet out like, if you read one hour a day and write one hour a day and like train one hour a day, like that's kind of the formula for, to like succeed in anything yeah. within five years. And that went mega viral. Yeah. But like, I was like, wow, that's so cool. But like, yeah, you can't copy, you can't copy 5,000 retweets. It's just, okay, man, that, that apparently everyone on that day thought that was a great idea. Then I've had things where I've tweeted out that went viral that I didn't want to go viral. It, you know, like, that's higher. <laughs> you know, the 12 Steps Being a Beautiful Woman, which was like that, like that went crazy viral. I remember yeah. I got, and I got doxxed and I got news media hitting me up. And that was actually just a, like, what was that? Actor person, I don't even know who the guy was. He had a list of things like 12 things women don't need to be. I'm like, this is so try hard. Oh so I'm like, my. I'm just going to reverse it and tweet it. And then that went mega viral. You're like, so I, I had four days of just like people telling me to go kill myself. Yeah. You know? like, I'm like, all right, that fine. <laughs> so it was one of those days I woke up and social media upset me within five minutes. I closed the lid and I did this whole mental thing where I went through. I was like, that's just the internet. It's just people being rude. Um, who knows what's going on with everybody today? But real life is not like that, and that's a good thing. And then I ended up going to the, to the supermarket, and where, I don't know, it was just one of those days where the internet was at the supermarket. <laughs> and uh, I was like, that's it. We are, definitely, we are definitely doomed. I just saw so much rudeness and... The supermarket of all places is not a typical place where you would see that. No. In fact, no. a lot of times you see people being very cordial at the supermarket. Sorry, I was in your way, but it, this is just day people were yelling at each other. They might as well have been throwing food at each other, but uh, it certainly uh, it seems like that, that it's just getting a bit out of hand. And I don't know if we're gonna be able to stop it. But one thing that gives me encouragement, and this is the place that we're all in in Twitter, which is, no matter how much negativity, no matter what's going on, and of all the other insanity that has happened, there is this, there has been, I guess, a pushback against pop culture and all the insanity, where people are like, hey, let's use this to build businesses, build relationships, and, and build ourselves to the best people we could possibly be. And this is... This seems to be relatively new, or it has definitely been bubbling. You know, we could, we could definitely credit Joe for carrying that torch. We've been around for 14 years. Uh, we're sort of in that mix somewhere. But it is now, this has gone to a point of mainstream, and that I think this is why we're seeing so much contention, because the, this other faction had held the internet down for so long that they're... I think maybe f in fear that they are losing control to better ideas, but th this is something that you've been working in, yeah. and and I definitely feel that my idea for this is that all young men and well all young people in general have to lose themselves in order to find themselves. So let them go off, let them go crazy. That's what young people do. However, when they are ready to pull themselves out of that, they need voices that say, we're over here, when you're ready, let's go build yourself up, let's build you businesses, let's make you successful. That, but why are we, who are trying to do that for young people, being silenced? Yeah, this, is a, this is an interesting thing that I saw happen. I mean, I'm, I, I'm gonna be 31 this year, so when I, I mean, and this is being me being retrospective, but. The, the maturation process of especially being a young man is very much reflective like the hero's journey. Yes, like absolutely. You have, you have the known world, which is probably <laughs> high school, you know, school, high school, your parents. You have you know, maybe stepping out into the unknown, which you know for a lot of kids, college is a continuation of the known. But once you are, let's just say, out of that, you're an adult, you're you know, 19, 20, 21, 22, you have to go through a period of experiences. And then yeah. even with that, you're going to realize, okay, I don't know much. Like, you, if, like that breaks that teenage illusion that everybody has where you think you know everything sure. and you know nothing. Uh, and then like, how do you go about you know, developing yourself? How do you go about becoming the man that you want to be? The thing that I saw happen over the past you know, decade or so is that you know, whether, I mean, there's a lot, you can attribute a lot of reasons. Lack of parental figure, lack, lack of father figures. Yeah, we've had you know, Warren yeah. Farrell on the show and, mm -hmm. and 
I mean, what a, an adventure reading the boy, uh, boy crisis was. Yeah, there, okay, there you go. So yeah, see, so like lack of father figures, uh, men who were just raised by their mom, they, they didn't have a male role model at all. Uh, then you have, you know, guys were the boy crisis in school, they were kind of always marginalized. That's mm -hmm. just how it was. So they get to the stage of being, let's say, like 18, 19, like that early, you know, adult stage, and they don't really know how to be a man. And, that, and that's okay to admit that. We're like, I really don't know what I'm doing. Like, in it, that's every adult. Like, I don't know what every, I'm doing. Every, yes. You know, that like, is I every don't know adult. what I'm doing. <laughs> <laughs> ah, so, you know, so with that said, well, then what do you do? Well, you, you probably, it'd be helpful to have a mentor slash father figure, slash big brother figure. Yes. Like find someone older and you know, re reflect on those aspects of yourself that you need to develop. And the, the way I, I, I have like sort of what I call it the, the Tao of bro philosophy, mm -hmm. which I'm like, it's, it's a sort of like this secular, but sort of like sort of deem this the sort of like modern, like, you know, wired down stoic, you know, like from just living in gyms, working in the industry, like this like literal bro philosophy. And like, there's, there's four relationships that you have in life. There's, there's four, there's just four. You have your relationship with yourself, which, you know, for most people, that's the most fundamental one. Mm -hmm. You have your relationship with, like, your fellow men. And this is speaking to, like, the male perspective. Your relationship with your fellow men, like your brothers, this men in general, how you get along with guys. You have your relationship with women, which, for obviously, for men, that can be a huge area of problems, or it could be great. Like, that goes a lot more ways. Yeah. And then you have your relationship with the world at large, which is, are you successful? Do you have status? You know, like, how are you seen by people? And, like, those are the four areas you need to work on. And you know, for most guys, like, well, what's the what's, what's the most important one? The most important one is whatever this you feel needs the most work. Which, mm -hmm. when you're young, that might be yourself. Yeah, that might be you know, learning to overcome insecurities, developing self confidence. You know, and obviously, like women play a big role in that. Men sure. Get confidence from being good with women, but also men get confidence from having male friends and having guys you can rely on, having comrades and brothers in arms and people that support you. And if you have those things happening for yourself, I, I like who I am. I have a girlfriend, or I feel like I'm good with girls. However you want to say it, I've got guys, they're good guys, you're probably going to be successful you know, you know, in the world at large. You know, but if any of those areas are out of whack, you can, ha you can have three of them going on, and there could be one that just really holds you back. Absolutely. Or it could be all of them. I um, mean, that, that's just like the, that's the mental model I use. It makes it very just direct. I'm like, which, which one is it? You know, maybe it's everything, but like, which one could you know, we start? Where do I start? Which one could you start in today? <laughs> uh, but that's the mental model I use, and it's just interesting that yeah, I never expected to, I've said this many times, but like I never expected to be like a leader of men. But I realized that this a lot of guys, is for whether social reasons, parental reasons, you know, the way they were brought up culturally, uh, they, they really lack direction. And not even just lacking direction, they don't know that they can look in a direction. There's help out there. Yeah, you know, and that's why you know, like the male self-improvement industry, that's, that's a real industry. Mm -hmm. yeah, there's well, a reason. Well, if, if, if there wasn't a need for it, it wouldn't it, exist. It, it wouldn't exist. It wouldn't exist. And, Society is so vast today where, I mean, we can always romanticize the past and say, oh, it was, sim you know, it was simpler times. And maybe it was, but you know, the world is large. And to function a day and to, to get ahead in life, to, you know, to be a success or just to be happy with yourself, you have competing interests, you have competing narratives, you live in a cultural environment that can be, as you said, super contentious. Uh, you have all these different influences that are acting upon you at any given time. Yes. So, I mean, that's a lot to sift through. Like, I, and during the 1990s when I was growing up, I don't remember it being that way. Like, there was a certain level of social stability that just seemed to be there. And if you did the right things and the right steps, like, you were supposed to get supposedly what you were, you know, deserving of entitled to. But, like, that has changed dramatically the last many years. And, I mean, you could say, like, why has it changed? Uh, you know, maybe it's globalization. Maybe it's, it's economy. Maybe it's the Great Depression. Maybe, I mean, there's just so many things. You know, you could go down a laundry list of, like, it's this and that. But regardless, what do you need to do? What does an individual need to do? You need to be adaptable. You need to be self-aware. And you need to be ready, ready and willing and wanting to work on yourself and put yourself in the most advantageous position possible. You know, and, like, and for most guys, it's like the very... And this is a super bro, and it's basic, but it's true. For most guys, that starts with, do you like how you look? Do you feel strong? If you can go like this, and you're like, oh, I look pretty good, you're in a good place. If, you, if looking at yourself in the mirror makes you feel bad about yourself, start there. Start there. Uh, it's, it's interesting. I, for myself, growing up, I was on the, on the smaller side of the kids that were in the, in the sports. And... and, and when you get to be a teenager, you start to look around and you start to realize, okay, the girls are after those guys. It's obvious that that's not in my future. So I need an either A, 
I need to either hit the gym and start eating right and do those things or find a different way. Find another outlet that is going to allow me to get attention, approval, and acceptance from the opposite sex or mm -hmm. what not. For me, it was obvious it's rock and roll. It was playing music. Yeah, to be an artist. It, it was it was to be an artist. Yeah. I did my I was and it was funny because it went from I was already playing music because my dad was in bands and it was I wanted to be like my dad. That's but, cool. But the moment cool. that I realized that the girls are not gonna give me any attention unless I signal this this new thing. So it went from I play guitar at home to now I carry my guitar to school. <laughs> <laughs> Which, of course, completely worked, right? Because it's now. No, we, I mean, we, we all remember that guy. Everyone, every probably high school, maybe not every high school, every high school had that guy. Maybe you were that guy. It's like, oh, that's a guy, like, that guy can play guitar. Mm -hmm. And, like, the thing, I, I, I've, I've, I, you know, attraction and, like, relationship game, like, it's not my, you know, my area that I see, like, you know, I coach guys in, really. Um, and so there's certain things I just, I've never, I, I try to be like very, you know, self-effacing, honest. I'm like, there's certain things I haven't struggled with. Mm -hmm. Like, I've always, I've been always been tall. I've considered to be reasonably attracted by most people, you know, if I'm being real. Like, I've not struggled with girls that way. But, um, you know, relative to like the, you know, the artistic standpoint, I realized that when I got into dancing that oftentimes men think, like, when we think of what attracts women, it's like, oh, yeah, the, the big and tall guys. Like, yeah, like, it did be, definitely being an athlete, that, that helps. That gets people attention. <laughs> but, you know, with, like, if you really get into, like, the nitty-gritty of female psychology, women are really drawn to men that make them feel something, that mm -hmm. emotional response. Of course. And nothing does that more powerfully than art. Nothing does that. You know, you, like, you can go to a sport, you can go to a stadium, mm -hmm. where 30,000 people watch a football game. You can go to a rock concert, and there's 100,000 people there. And half of it's women, and they are going crazy. Going crazy. Absolutely insane. Well, it, also, one of the things that I've been trying to promote on Twitter is to start producing and produce more than you are, try to produce more than you are consuming. Now, that's a ridiculously mm. difficult task. However, it's not impossible. You can reach there, and, and it's good for you. Right. And, it, and it certainly helps with with your mental well-being and how you feel about yourself and what's going on around you. And, and, and it's interesting to see uh, how, much, how many people have trouble with just, well, what, where do I start in creating? Well, what are you into? <laughs> just go, just start, grab, you like painting? Go grab a brush and start painting. You, I, think the most, I think the easiest place to start is just write. Write about yourself. Write about your day. Write about how you're feeling. Write about an, an event that you're going to and how you feel about it. These are the simple steps that will get you started. And we certainly don't see in pop culture of journaling of how masculine or how effective it can be for young men. You know, you've never seen John Wayne come after, uh, uh, after a day on the range and start journaling. If they showed that, there'd be a line of guys down the CVS looking to get... A journal. The creative aspect of being a man, like that gets this gets modern masculinity is very dumbed down. It's like mm -hmm. uh, you know, my buddy Sermon always calls it like it's like boobs and beer masculinity. I like boobs and I drink beer and like and bacon, you know, like man cave. It, I, it's this is why my I've always had a problem with Adam Carolla because as much as I like Adam, he always had a part of the man show, which I felt just was the dumbest, dumbed down mm -hmm. thing, and which. Which, when everyone thinks about it, they're like, oh, man show, that's masculine, that's what guys like. N no, not, not really. No. no. <laughs> In fact, I don't know who that show was for. <laughs> I, I, that's like a media creation. It's, it's like the dumb dad and like the, the sitcom mm -hmm. kind of thing, where you go back to like the 1950s and it's like, uh, what was the show with the eight kids, like the Waltons? Mm -hmm. Yeah, and the father's like a, this very competent, stoic figure that's yeah. there to provide guidance and... You know, guidance and security and safety and like he loves everybody like he's he's, he's very laconic in how he speaks and you're like wow that's that's actually a good role model and you get to like 1990s 2000s and it's like the homer simpson yeah and, and i mean yeah homer is kind of like a parody of like you know perhaps the american man but you you could see how it devolved and you know all the guys that i'm friends with now like my circle of friends that they're they have a lot of depth like mas mas lot. masculinity has depth and breadth mm -hmm. if we go back and look at things that get very uh, idolized by men you know, samurai you know, like the samurai were artists, like they devoted their life to a very defined code of ethics mm -hmm. and honoring how they spoke and how they acted and how they developed themselves. It was not just fighting. Uh, you know, there was a lot to it. You know, same thing with knighthood. You know, same thing with even superheroes. Like if you go, you know, Batman, read the comic books, which I, like, I was a huge Batman fan as a kid. They're pretty intellectually heavy. 
Like, yeah. They're not simple stories, most of them. Like, especially for Batman during the 1990s. I don't know about now, because I haven't read them in a while since the, the tonality changed, but like very intensely, darkly psychological. Oh, of like, course. This is, not, this is not a shallow character at all. So like when I see that today, I'm like, it's... This isn't really representative of what a man is. Well, th I think this is represented in all the acclaim that a movie like The Joker had gotten. Now, I saw that a movie when it was originally made. It was called Taxi Driver in the, in the <laughs> 70s. Like, I, and, and now, I'm not taking anything no, no, away no. from The Joker, but it's a, it is a descent. Into, it's one man's journey into descent and madness of, from modern society. That's what Taxi Driver was. And whenever we see this, and people, I don't, they, they start freaking out. Well, it's like, well, if you continue, and, and I think Warren Farrell put it best, boys who hurt, hurt others. Yeah. Men who hurt will hurt others. And once again, if, if you are ignored, and you are made to feel invisible, and, and there is no one there to nurture and help you through your own void, which we all have to contend with and deal with, that can go sideways, especially if there has been any abuse or psychological damage done in your childhood that will not allow you to make that journey through. But, and people freak out. And when, when, we, when we show it on screen, people start losing their minds. So it's like, well, what do you think is going to happen? This is a warning. This is not... This is not fantasy. Yeah, even, yeah, even Taxi Driver, like, I don't know if that movie would even get made today. No. That's an interesting thing where you could, probably couldn't make Taxi Driver today because it would be, I mean, it, it, it's, it's, it's this, you know, this is the paradox of modern media. It'd be like, you know, this is a terrible film, misogyny, something, something. And like, this, is, this film is about a tragic character and their descent into the self destruction. Yeah. Like, this is not an idol, this is not a heroic figure. But like when you apply the Joker sort of um, archetype on top of it, where it's like, okay, what's well, from a comic book? And now, it's a so fictional it's, character. Now, now, now we can make it. But like, you know, trauma never goes away; it just changes forms. Mm -hmm. and, it, and that could go. That could be good or bad. Usually, it's bad, unfortunately. But you, you see that film, and like, I, I, I viewed that as almost like a cathartic moment for a lot of society of like, sure. yeah, this is actually how I'm feeling. And there was no violence from that film. Nobody went crazy afterwards. No. But like it reflected the state of like it reflected like a large state of modern society. I'm like, yes, a lot of people, especially men, feel very marginalized. And it's just also the modern world at large, where people feel invisible and they feel stuck in their position. And there's extreme, you know, stratification of, you know, whether you may not, all you, know, you could say, wealth, like elitism, and power, you know, the ability to be heard. And like, the films reflect the era they're made in. Like, the fact yes, that that, absolutely. The fact that, that was culturally relevant and that made a billion dollars. That that should say something. That like. Maybe we're living through strange times. Yeah, and to go uh, along with that, uh, so right now we're having what the media is showing to be this epidemic of gun violence through uh, through um, America and these schools, and and yeah, it, it seems that gun violence has gotten younger, but it's but you've always had stray monkeys who have whose bolts weren't all quite that right and who went nuts. Uh, when I was growing up, the, uh, there was this idea of that guy's going to go postal one day. <laughs> so, and that was said because there had been several incidences in the 80s where a postal worker came to work and shot up the place. This is nothing new. Now, perhaps maybe the ages are getting a little bit younger from what I can tell. But this is, it's not new. It's always been there. You're always going to have folks who are not quite like the other monkeys. They're a little bit unhinged. And, and if, if they do feel marginalized and isolated, and the internet gives a lot of these folks an opportunity to, to converge and, and, and talk to each other. Yeah. Now, that was the thing that wasn't there before. And so now this, those moments when this happened, there's others linked to it. And uh, certainly when we hear about this, we hear, oh, he was on these forums and he was talking with these people and he was encouraged to do this and this they all knew this was gonna happen. Well, that's that is that is a that's a part of it, but it's not what created it. Th no. It was always there. No, what created it was their personal experience, but I mean, I mean modern society, one of the things I try to encourage people to do, and just speaking to the level of the individual, like 
modern society in, in many ways, like it's ugly, like it is. And I say that not to be nihilistic, but like you can very much create a social media feed and even like a real life perspective of feeling victimized and persecuted and you can, it's sort of like a mental virus. Mm -hmm. like the whole world's against you and the world's terrible. That's, it's very easy for that to happen. If you want to create a good life, like, this is why I tell you know, my followers, people, I'm like, you have to cultivate beauty. Yes. Like, like, you know, my girlfriend's beautiful. Like, I'd be, be with a beautiful girlfriend. Like, create a beautiful life. Like, have, have beautiful friends. Have beautiful moments and relationships. And have things where within your daily inhabitment of your space, you can look to and they are satisfying to you and, like, it makes you appreciate existence. But a lot of people don't have that. And I don't know that modern life really gives that to anybody. Well, it's all based on utility over beauty. And that's, that is something that... When I'm uh, being such an, um, a person who comes from an arty back, an artist background, it's like, where is that? Why does everything have to be uh, f built for utility over beauty? In the past, we saw things that were built because they were the, the builders wanted to appeal to something that was above man. It's it was aspirational. Aspirational. It's something that everyone can look towards, and and want to be a part of. When you dumb everything down to utility. Well, that, that's not very uh, aspiring. No, I mean, efficien efficiency is a false god. Like, it's, it's, a, it's, a bloodless, it, it's a bloodless instrument that leaves, like, a bloody trail. When you look at society, you know, let's say, 1950s, like, you know, gun ownership. Gun ownership was more widespread in 1950 than it was today. You could, in 1950, 1960, probably up to 19, 1980s even, you could be a kid and you could carry around a hunting rifle. Absolutely, yep. You could be in your car. I'm like, the accessibility of, of guns has decreased with time, hasn't increased. Yeah, yet, you know, so, well, gun violence is on the rise. Okay, is it, is it the instrument or is it the society that we live in? Yeah, we know, like, you know, like, if you growl off statistics, like, okay, so, you know, teen suicides, like, it's doubled over the last few years. Yep. Okay, male suicides gone up 4X over so many yep. years. All right, female suicide's gone up. All right, prescription drug abuse has gone up. Okay, opioid addiction has gone up. And uh, Jonathan Haidt uh, put it together and gave you bas basically gave us a time frame of when it exponentially hockeys their growth and all these terrible things. Yeah, so you, I mean, you have, yeah, so like, hey, like you have all these metrics and like, all right, like everything, like human despair, positive <coughs> future, this is all, everything's getting worse by people's perception and people are literally, they're killing themselves at an increased rate. Like that, that's happening. Is that contributing to people's sensibility that society is something to lash out at? Yeah, it probably is. Probably. Like, those should all be indicators to you. But, yeah, obviously, you know, power is it be? Like, how is it going to change? Yeah, I, like I keep saying, like, it always goes back to you. Like, can you, if you can create a life that is, let's just say, a shining example of other people, hopefully that has a powerful effect. Like you can't, I, you can't control anything outside of that. Mm -hmm. yeah, I can't. Yeah, I can't. I, 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 we could talk about these things, but I can't like directly affect affect any of them. Mm -hmm. Yeah, you know, but I can have an effect. Yeah, you know, I can't have my. I can have my life be that effect upon others. Hopefully, I can do that for myself, and you know, and hopefully that's sufficient. Well, the the other thing to go along with that, though we're seeing these problem areas, the the violence overall is going down. Well, that's it. <laughs> You know, on, that's, on a that's grand a scale, on a grand scale, yeah. So we have these issues, but on a grand scale, uh, it, everything, all the markers are going down. And Stephen Pinker laid out great arguments mm -hmm. uh, and stats f for all that. Um, and once again, this goes back to the media and all that. But I don't want to roll this conversation in there. I wanted to roll the conversation, uh, lastly, into something that you have going on, mm -hmm. which is. Uh, you're about to leave the States. And one of the reasons why yes. I wanted to get you in here before you head out was uh, that you are planning on living abroad for a while. And I would yes. love to, to tap into that and talk about that. Because uh, our conversation the other day on the phone uh, certainly brought up some, some interesting aspects I'd yeah. like to talk about. Yeah, it was, it was traveling abroad. So, I mean, so we talk about these social problems. Like, So this is, this is the sort of experienced continuum of traveling abroad. So I spent all my 20s I spent all of my 20s working. Like, I, mm -hmm. I was, you know, tr personal training in terms of hours. Like, it's a very long job. You get, to, you get your first client at 6 a.m. Your last one could be at 7 p.m., even 8 p.m. It's a long day. And I spent all of my 20s working. I built my business to a level where I, I got freedom. And I got freedom in the sense where, like, okay, I have, I have financial freedom. I have freedom to do anything I want whenever I want at any given time. I'm like, and once you have that, it raises certain questions where, okay, what do I really want to do? And most people, they work, to, they work to pay bills. They work to, 
you know, because you have to support people. They work because you know, that's what you do in life. And you know, to be in a position where you can do anything you want in any given day and you are constrained by nothing, well, now what? And so I was like, you know, I want to travel. So I'd, I'd gone to Romania last year for mm-hmm. about, I think it was for like five and a half, six weeks. And I was with friends there, um, you know, uh, Andrew and Tristan Tate. They're very good friends of mine, great guys. Um, but I was with them, and I was like really like living it up, partying, just having fun. Yeah. And then you know, being in a place where there was it was so far removed from the United States, it just puts living to perspective. You realize that there are there's hundreds of countries in the world, well over 100. Yeah, you know, not 200. There's what 170 countries. You go to any country. There's a flow to life. Each place is unique. Yeah, and every place has its problems. Every place has its pros. And every place can have beautiful moments and beautiful things, and beautiful experiences, and beautiful people. And you're there, and this gives you a sense, in a good way, of the smallness of one's individual life, where oh you're, my, you're just yeah. one person of many. You're one person of many, and you know, you're, what you think are problems may not be problems at all. They may just be this passing, transient periods of time. So I, I came back from that trip, and was like, all right, you know, I told my girlfriend, like, I'm leaving LA. You can stay or you can go, like, I'm, but I'm leaving. Like, I want to travel. Not to find myself where, like, oh, I get answers. I'm like, I want to this, see this different parts of the world and see different cultures and just, you know, and maybe take the best from each or find something I identify with, but just enjoy that beauty that is this humanity, just see the beauty of human existence. Um, you know, so that's my, pl- I'm actually leaving in a, what is it, Ten? nine days? Yeah. yeah, nine days, to, uh, I'm going to Egypt first, uh, because I always want to see Egypt. So any, any, it's like the Indiana Jones thing, like, mm-hmm. where I want to go and have an adventure. That place sounds cool, pyramids, mummies, a lot of history, you know, from when I was a kid, I'm like, that has to be cool, right? So we're gonna Absolutely. Go um, so I'm going there first, but but that's the plan. Um, and it, I mean, traveling is like an aspiration for many, of course. And it, you know, some people I think falsely do it, hoping they'll give them answers. You, you don't get answers from traveling. It just is more like a, it's like a very sort of like a like harsh mirror where when you're by yourself in a new place and you don't speak the language, it's amazing. And, and you're there, and you just you only have you can access your own personal narrative. But you, you know, and let's say you struggle to communicate with people, you will find out very quickly what you're made out of. One hundred percent. And your reactions to just whatever happens to you, and how people interact there, and then you pick up on nuances in body language, and you know how people speak to each other. You're like, okay, like who am I? So it really, it, I think it really clarifies your identity for you. Hopefully, I mean, it should. Yeah, um, it was a few years ago where I actually had the opportunity of traveling by myself for a long period of time. It was two weeks, and I was in at that time. I was checking out. Uh, Portugal, mm. and I was very excited because I've, all, I've I've traveled a lot, but there's always been influence attached to it. There was always friends around. There was always an agenda of what we were going to do because we were in the company of each other. So I saw this as an opportunity that I would be detached from all influence, and the only except for the influence of the beauty and and the, what was around me. The civilization was around me. And so how I was, I planned on going into that started what is a stream of consciousness that I have on my phone of, on pages that is open. So I would go and I would go to visit these sites and I would just start, down, jot, start jotting down what was coming to my mind. What was I thinking? And this is something we mentioned, I mentioned to you on the phone, which is this is amazing to me. You never really truly know just what's going on inside if you have other people around that you're answering towards, mm-hmm. uh, answering to. And so here I am standing in front of something that was thousands of years old that we don't get to uh, really see, man-made thousands of years old here in America. I'm sitting, I'm standing there and I'm looking at it and it's awe-inspiring. We don't have very many uh, man-made wow. spa, uh, awe-inspiring things. And I'm looking at it and I'm being flooded with so much inspiration and thoughts. And I was like, I need to capture all this. And the only way to do that is to start writing. Mm -hmm. And I'm writing, I'm just, and it's a stream of consciousness. It doesn't matter if it makes sense. It will just be, it'll be what it is, but it will be captured. And so I had, this started a process that has now a, a, a normal thing for me. Whenever these thoughts pop up, I just put them in, and, and which has made for great Twitter fodder. Oh yeah, oh, yeah. <laughs> no doubt. How but to be, a, and so now, 
I want to have these moments more often. So I'm, I, for AJ and myself, we're always trying to travel a bit to, uh, to experience more of those moments. And, and I'm very excited for you to really have this opportunity uh, as well. I mean, obviously, you know, it's beneficial. But the thing I was, we were mentioning on the phone is we're talking about things that men had, had decided to do that they weren't even going to see. Never it. see it. They're never going to see it. They're still building it. <laughs> so, I mean, I know you, you live in LA. I lived in LA on off basically the last 10 years. You know, it, it's, a, it's old in LA is something like you'll, you know, maybe you're somewhere and it's like a house or a building. Like, you know, that was, you know, that when I was built, it was built in 1920. You're like, oh, wow. Oh, yeah. Years ago. <laughs> yeah, I remember, being, I remember being in India in 2014. I was there for six months with a, a client who's a Bollywood actor. Um, his name's a very well known uh, Indian actor. Wow. So, I, so I was there, I was training him for a film role. I'm, I'm in India for you know, basically half the year. And we went, I traveled all over the country in, of India. And I'm not, I have no connection to the deal, obviously. I'm, just, I'm an outsider, truly an outsider. Don't look like, of course, I don't look like the people. But I'm there, and I'm, I'm going to temples, I'm going to these historical sites. And when was this built? Uh, this was built in you know, 100 AD. You know, this was built in, <laughs> it, was, it, was, we, it, it, it was built sometime between. Uh, 300 and 400 BC, and you're looking at it, you're like, this is this is a 2,000 year old building. Yeah, and it took 100 years to build. Yep, and the guy that started building it died probably, let's just say, maybe at the best, a third of the way through the process. So it was mm -hmm. built by like their sons and their grandsons. I'm like, and it's still here, and people are still coming to it, and it's still perfectly maintained. And you know, like and this makes you realize like their sense of whatever their ethics and values were, like they had the utmost faith in the eternality that they were going to last and endure forever. And they have, and they have. And then, but then, and then you look at, you know, let's say like the social media things where it's like, you know, did, did my post get likes today? You're like, this, 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 is, so, this, this is dust in the wind. This is, this is ashes in a blizzard. It's, pa this, it's so ephemeral. And so fleeting, and so nothingness. And we, yeah, we, we attach ourselves to it. We, and we also tend to think that we're smarter than these folks. We phones. think, yeah. And, and something I want to add to that: not only is all that amazing, then you look at how it was built, and you realize that some of the stones were dragged <laughs> 500 miles away from some weird <laughs> island. You're like, why would you even? How did you? How did you put this on paper? And go. Yeah, this is a great That's idea. That's a great idea. We're going to do this. <laughs> that is something. Talk about aspiring to beauty over utility. I mean, that's it, it, it is for the sake of beauty that that is being done. I mean, because no person in their right mind for utility is like, yeah, this will, this will be good. No, no, no one builds an ugly building to last. Like, I mean, you know, that's why, like, brutalist, brutalist architecture, even that, that 20th century aesthetic, like, it's very inhuman. Yes. Yeah, I mean, I, that's like a whole weird discussion, but like, I, I have friends that are architects, and like, yeah, there's like a subset of architecture there. It's like, we gotta be subversive and like make things ugly. I'm like, none of that stuff is going to endure. No. It's like, I mean, I've been to like a few communist countries, and, you know, parts like the old Soviet block housing, like, it's horrifying to look at. But yeah. it's just it's just straight lines. It's just straight lines and it's gray, like not brick, like gray concrete. And you look at it, and you're like, this like this makes you, it makes you sad. It, it makes you angry and like, depressed. Like, you get away from it. It gives you an idea of of um, the mental state of people who were living in the, those conditions, what they had to contend with. How do you get excited? How do you get fired up? How do you get inspired about each day if everything around you is square, weird, dull colors? I mean, it's only going to add to the depression that your economic state and is in. No, no, yeah. There's no. I don't know how you could be happy in those conditions. I, I, this is like a Roger Scruton kind of like I'm yeah. very badly paraphrasing, but I mean the thing with. Yeah, beauty and aesthetics. Like this is like bodybuilding. I, I've thought about this for a long time because yeah, one level like like bodybuilding is like it's shallow. Like I want to look a certain way and I want people to look at me. But if you get to like the cultural roots of it, like late 1800s, sort of like physical culture, the idea was, and you know, someone can agree or disagree, and this is not this is not like a political statement, but like the idea was like okay, like a, a man man is made in the image of God, or you know, man is a being that he is made to be, you know, an aspirational being, an ascendant being. And you should you should be able to embody that, and you can embody that, and that can be accessed through the, the training and the trials and tribulations of the body. That's entirely that's attainable, and that can be created and built. 
but then also in like an artwork and things you create as well, like what does beauty capture? It captures what is good. So we know that we live in a world where we can experience joyous moments or loving moments or romantic moments or things that just, just for, well, even if it's a short two minute conversation experience, you walk away and like you have gratitude for that. Like all that is wrapped into what is a beautiful structure or a beautiful body or a beautiful person, a beautiful building. That's all present, it's all there. And we look at that, you're like, wow, like that, that's amazing. It could be a car. You can, look at a, you can look at a car and be like, like you can look at a classic 1971 Corvette, you're like, yeah, wow, I was just like, about wow, to look say at the same thing. Like, look at this, wow, man. Like, it is like, it's, the curves, and it's not rational. Like, <laughs> no. like, rationality does not underlie existence. Like, it's irrational and you can't quantify it. You can qualify it, you can, but you can't quantify it. It will never make sense, you know, by any metric truly. But it just it triggers something in you, or you look at, it and you're you're held by your, it captures your attention, and somehow you want to interact with it and feel it or, or drive it, like you want to put yourself with it within like the space that inhabits, yeah. And, and that's just always astounding to me. And, and you see that like you travel, like we don't have the United States so much, but like when you travel, you go to you can go to old European cities, you go to Krakow, you're like oh my, my god. god, like in Poland, like my god, look at this city, this is beautiful, look at this city, like it's been there for you know thousand something years. And people built that so they could live in it, like literally just live in it, and just look, go out of their home every day, like, yeah, I live in a lovely place, mm -hmm. and feel good. And it, like, you know, it could be, a, it could be, I'm sure it was, it was more than that, but you know, that simplicity of that emotional, you know, uh, experience of being able to wake up and you can look outside in a city, you know, no less, not like a natural setting, but a city, you're like, what a beautiful city. It's amazing. Yeah, but you're probably gonna have a good day, <laughs> probably, hopefully. I think we'll end it there. Yeah. Right on. Alexander, yeah, thank you very much for being here today and oh, being on, the first guest for our first new segment, uh, The Art of Charm Happy Hour. If you guys have any comments, questions, anything, you can throw them in the comments below. Make sure you hit that subscribe button, and we'll be seeing you guys soon. But I feel alive.